Bulls of monarchy and the real homes of our royal family. But what really goes on inside? Join us as we peek through the royal keyhole and discover what lies behind the gilded gates of Buckingham Palace. There's a Coots ATM in the basement, should the Queen ever decide she does need to carry cash. Kensington Palace. It's believed to have cost 4.5 million to renovate this 20-room apartment. And Windsor Castle. A bell would be rung, and the princesses with their nanny would rush down to the dungeons, which were described as beetle-infested. We reveal the hidden stories of these iconic buildings. From the Royal Upholsterer, it was something like you'd see on Downton Abbey. There were just staff everywhere. To the provider of royal cots. I was very surprised, actually, how relaxed a visit was. And Prince Charles's party designer. And he said, would I just go in and make, make the, 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 the place look a bit different? We unearth dark palace histories. They hold a gun to her pregnant stomach and they stab him and throw him down the stairs and hear from those who've lived and worked within their walls. I remember kind of turning around and the Queen was behind me. And I remember thinking, help. <laughs> These are the secrets of the royal palaces. Elizabeth II has dozens of places to lay her hat. But the showstoppers are her official residences, the palaces. Buckingham, Kensington, St. James's, and Windsor Castle in England, Hillsborough Castle in Northern Ireland, and Holyrood in Scotland. To the royal family, a palace is their office. It's where they work. To the rest of us, uh, it's a fairy tale. The most famous of all, Buckingham Palace. While the average British house has five rooms, the Queen's London home has an incredible 775, including 52 royal and guest bedrooms, 188 staff bedrooms, 92 offices, and 78 bathrooms. I mean, the whole place is an absolute warren of big and small rooms. Safe to say it takes a while to get to know how to get a ride. I mean, I, I, to this day, if you put me in there, I still wouldn't know how to get from A to B. Buckingham Palace is a Royal HQ, the office. And it's in the 19 state rooms that the real business of monarchy happens, entertaining on a grand scale. I know that all my family join me in wishing you a very enjoyable evening. Thank you. The staterooms are the public face of Buckingham Palace. Incredibly gilded, um, famously lavish rooms, which are there to serve a public purpose. And the royals have a secret trick up their sleeve to make them appear extra grand. There's a lot of mirrors around, and I remember asking somebody, why so many mirrors? And it was to give the, the sense that it's even bigger you know, than what it already is. The ballroom is the largest room in the palace, with a ceiling the height of three double-decker buses. In the ballroom, is used uh, primarily for investitures, which happen about 25 times a year. There's a people who are awarded honors. It's also where most state banquets are held. If you find laying the table a chore, spare a thought for the staff here. The average host would have six guests for dinner. Imagine preparing the room for a visiting head of state and 150 dignitaries. It takes an entire week. Another world famous part of the palace is the throne room. The throne room, it's the room where both Kate and William's wedding photographs were taken. But also, uh, William's grandmother, the Queen and Prince Philip, their wedding photos were taken in that room. The thrones, or chairs of estate, if you're in the know, were specially made for the Queen's coronation in 1953. The Queen moves past them on her way to the chair of estate, 
which she is to occupy for the early part of the ceremony. But there have been other bums on these royal seats. In a recent interview, actor Ian McKellen lets us in on what he and Judy Dench got up to at a palace function. We, we went on dancing round, <laughs> round the corner and found ourselves behind the band. And there, behind this sort of partition, were, were the, the thrones. Oh, well. So we sat on them. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen the throne in the throne room, and I'm here to tell you it's nothing to rave about. I know many people who have much grander armchairs, so if they want you to sit on it, they were being naughty, but I don't think the Queen's going to chop off their heads. <laughs> Sir Ian's not the only one to have poked around where he shouldn't have. For decades, Nikki Haslam was the go-to interior designer for celebrities and aristocrats. And for Prince Charles, who hired him to design a party inside Buckingham Palace. He was giving a Shakespeare evening, and he said, would I just go in and make, make the, 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 the place look a bit different? Given the run of the place, Nikki did what any one of us would and had a good rummage around. In the wonderful white drawing room, that I, 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 there was nobody else, there were no footmen, nothing, it was just me walking around. You'd open cupboards and there'd be everything one, like one has at home, sort of broken clocks and bits of string, just like anywhere else. And one felt, ah, oh, it's, like, it's, it's like my room, you know. Nicky and Sir Ian aren't the only ones whose behavior within the palace walls has been questionable. There are, of course, some delightfully funny stories about famous people behaving badly at Buckingham Palace. Most notably, of course, we have the Beatles who admitted to smoking cannabis in the loos at Buckingham Palace. And we know that Vivian Westwood went commando, or underwear free, uh, when she was herself in front of the Queen receiving an honor at Buckingham Palace. Margaret Taylor would never countenance such misbehavior. She's a Royal Palace's super fan. Welcome to Heritage House. Let me show you around my collection. Here we have Meghan and Harry. Margaret visits each of the main palaces several times a year. I think Buckingham Palace is the grandest one of all. There's something magical about it. The beautiful carpets, the beautiful pictures, um, paintings, uh, the gilt, the gold. I mean, you just know you're in a royal palace. This is Her Majesty's area here, plus up here, all my coronation mugs. I could fill the whole house with Her Majesty's stuff. It's brilliant. I think the real reason why the palaces play such a big part in our lives is because uh, history comes alive there. Margaret's just one of 50,000 people who visit Buckingham Palace every year. But with a working HQ of 800 staff, the real surprises lurk behind what the public see. Post office, there's a chapel, there is a doctor's surgery that's actually kitted out for genuine surgical procedures if there's an emergency. It's a swimming pool. Uh, when I was working there, I used it regularly, I used it every day, but then I gave up after a while because Princess Margaret used to use it. There's a Coots ATM in the basement, should the Queen ever decide she does need to carry cash. There used to be a staff bar. It was got rid of a few years ago because um, the staff were getting a little bit uh, worse for wear during the course of the day. Luckily, her Majesty has ways of avoiding her squiffy servants. I remember once watching the Queen walking uh, towards what I thought was a mirror and a table and thinking, what's going to happen? You know, what's she going to do? And as she walked up to it, the, the, it opened and through she went. Behind the mirror, a genuine secret passageway leading to the Queen's private apartments. The Queen has to have a secret passage. She can't trail through miles and miles of corridors with people gawping at her. 
on that side table that's attached to the mirror, all the ornaments and so on are glued on, so nothing will fall off as the door is opened. Coming up, we reveal why William's behaviour at Buckingham Palace got him a right royal telling off. During the balcony appearance at Trooping the Colour, he was bending down talking to George. Um, and we don't do that. And the horrible secrets hidden beneath Windsor Castle. The princesses with their nanny and, and other staff members would rush down to the dungeons, which were described as beetle infested. The royal palaces, centerpieces of national events and ancient homes of our royal family. Or not so ancient. Because, despite being such an established HQ, Buckingham Palace is a relatively new build. Architecturally, Buckingham Palace started off as a very beautiful house, arguably um, the most beautiful in England, and it gradually got worse. Built for the Duke of Buckingham at the end of the 17th century, it became a royal residence when George III bought it in 1761, transforming it into the palace that is still visible from the garden. This great spread has engulfed old Buckingham House. For his granddaughter, Queen Victoria, the existing palace wasn't enough, so she added a huge new wing in front of it. You end up with something which is a monster, frankly. The next to have a tinker was George V. He decided to fix the bodge job by adding a new facade of Portland stone creating the palace we see today. Scaffolding came down summer 1913, blistering bright stone, new Baroque palace. The royals had the appearance, the semblance of a great European power, finally. It was Victoria who made the first public appearance on that famous balcony. A tradition that caught on. It is a focal point where people can gather and watch and wait for news. Greater and greater crowds surge around the palace railings as onto the balcony come the royal family, accompanied by our Prime Minister himself. VE Day, the ending of the war, everything has always been focused on the balcony. Of course, so many iconic moments whether it's you know, the kiss after um, Charles and Diana's wedding. The crowd called, kiss her, kiss her. So that's the first public royal kiss. I think my favorite has got to be at the wedding of Kate and William, where William's three-year-old uh, goddaughter, Grace Van Cutsen, was seen to be holding her hands to her ears in horror and looking down at the, the huge crowds and the noise they were making. More recently, um, the, the Queen slightly um, admonished the Duke of Cambridge because uh, during the balcony appearance at Trooping the Colour, mm. he was bending down talking to George. Um, and we don't do that. We, we maintain not necessarily rigid attention, but upright so that um, the public can see you and um, no fiddling around. In contrast to the pomp and circumstance of state events, the royal's private apartments are relatively humble. I think I was going to interview Prince Edward or something, so I went up in this rickety old-fashioned lift, like a really old-fashioned hotel, sort of wire lift, clanking the way up. And then I noticed when I got out, the, they had these very, very long corridors. And there was um, a sort of toy horse, a sort of pushing horse. And I thought, God, I wonder if that ever belonged to the Queen. It's not just the interior of the building that can seem a little dilapidated. In some places, the outside is crumbling away. Bits of masonry falling off uh, the parapet of the, of the roof. I saw a piece narrowly miss the Princess Royal quite a number of years ago. It would be too embarrassing if a bit of masonry fell onto the head of a treasured head of state. And even more embarrassing if it fell onto the head of state who nobody liked. 
<laughs> it's true. What can you imagine? A bit of masonry falling on poor Donald Trump's head. <laughs> Perhaps it's no surprise the Queen is rumoured not to be fond of her giant disintegrating home. It's a very institutional building. None of them likes it, including not the Queen. No, it's not true the Queen doesn't like Buckingham Palace. It's just that it is part of the job, goes with the territory, she is head of state, um, and she lives at Buckingham Palace when she's working in London. To escape the office, most weekends, the Queen goes to relax at her home near Slough, Windsor Castle. It might not be a palace by name, but it's bigger and grander than any other royal residence. I think Windsor Castle is, is very much what everyone kind of imagines a, a Queen or King uh, to live in. It's the, the fairy tale, isn't it? The kind of that, that, that thing that people associate with royalty. Windsor Castle is the oldest castle in the world that's been continually lived in. 39 or 40 monarchs have lived there. It's an extraordinary place. And enormous. Windsor is even bigger than Buckingham Palace, with a thousand rooms spread over 13 acres. William the Conqueror began the building in 1066. But a lot of it is a 200-year-old fake, thanks to George IV. He found the walls too low. He found there weren't enough crenellations, you know, all the castle bits you expect. And so this was raised by a whole story and added towers, one over here, and given much more uh, dramatic, picturesque value. That's what gives us the impression of Windsor today, is 19th century romanticism, looking back on the Middle Ages, thinking, I want that, but essentially on steroids. Just as at Buckingham Palace, royal ceremony is centered on Windsor State Apartments. The most impressive of which is St. George's Hall, this room alone has seven times the floor space of an entire average British home. There's a sort of magic about it when there is a, a, a state visit and it happens to be in Windsor. People take an intake of breath when they walk into St George's Hall because it is so magnificent. You get 170 people around this long table that stretches from one end to the other and the evening is candlelit. Prince Philip and I are delighted to welcome you to Windsor Castle. Nearby is St George's Chapel, where some of the most high-profile royal events take place. One of the most amazing experiences was when I attended the wedding of the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall as a guest, with uh, members of their family, diplomats, celebrities. So it was a, a fantastic experience. More recently, it was the venue for Harry and Meghan's wedding, watched by a global audience of hundreds of millions. It's no secret Elizabeth II loves Windsor. What child wouldn't want to grow up in a castle? The Queen adores Windsor. Her formative years were spent there. These pictures were taken at Windsor. Delightful family pictures reflecting the happy atmosphere in which Princess Elizabeth was growing up. During the war years, she and her sister, Princess Margaret, were down there all the time. When there was the suspicion of you know, an actual air raid, a bell would be rung in Windsor Castle, and the princesses with their nanny and, and other staff members would rush down to the dungeons, which were described as beetle-infested. Today, the Queen spends most weekends and Easter at Windsor. But what of the rest of the royal family? Of all the palaces, it's Kensington that is home to the most royals like a massive royal house share. There is Prince and Princess Michael of Kent. You've got the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester. The Duke of Kent. Eugenie and her new husband in Ivy Cottage. 
the best known of all as um, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. The Queen's basically a royal letting agent, except she's not making any money out of this at all, and no one has to pay a deposit. One of Kensington Palace's most unusual residents was introduced by King George I after a hunting trip to his native Hanover. His name was Peter the Wild Boy. Peter the Wild Boy was one of the biggest celebrities in 18th century England. He was a small boy, about 11 or so, who was found running naked in the woods and completely feral. The king, George I, had him brought back to the palace as a sort of pet. He's like a dog or a cat to them. They can poke him, they can play with him, they can teach him to read. He's an experiment. They wanted to civilize him and turn him into a marvelous, posh young man. But Peter was not responsive to their efforts to teach him to read or write. We think he had something called Pitt Hopkins syndrome, which will make it very difficult to write and speak. So it was almost impossible that he ever would. So after a while, the royal family got a bit bored of him and sent him off to live on a farm. I'm sure he was much happier living on his quiet farm than he ever would have been as a pet, as an object of fascination at Kensington Palace. But there would be other objects of fascination at Kensington. The Queen's sister, Princess Margaret, and her husband would make the palace the centre of a social scene that mixed royalty and celebrity like never before. Princess Margaret and Lord Snowden were one of the hottest couples of the 60s. Hollywood Monday, fourth day of Princess Margaret's tour. They knew the Beatles. They knew Peter Sellers and Britt Eklund. The entertained people like Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. And Kensington Palace has remained a party hub. Until recently, the ultimate celeb royal combo, Meghan and Harry, lived in Nottingham Cottage. The French ambassador, who, whose um, home backs on to Kensington Palace, said in a recent interview that it's gotten so much quieter since Harry and Meghan left. We used to see garden parties that went on late into the night, fireworks, all kinds of revelry and fun. And now all we hear are the helicopters coming and going. In contrast, William and Kate have a more outdoorsy lifestyle. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge have outside space in apartment 1A. Uh, they've got a very large walled garden. When you've got three children, you can put them out there to play in, in the warm weather. They are frequently spotted playing with Prince George and Princess Charlotte in the garden, football, uh, looking for spiders, uh, feeding ducks. But don't think all the royals are out playing football. In fact, most share a difficulty with many other of the capital's renters. There is, unfortunately, with most of the apartments, no outside space. Duke and Duchess of Gloucester, for example, they have no outside space. Um, there is a big green opposite. The royal household have tried to make it private by putting a sort of netting along the railings of Kensington Palace Gardens. But, you know, you can see over the top. Coming up, we reveal the Queen's interior design tastes. The Queen is big on chintz. She's big on patterns. She's never seen a pattern that she doesn't want to put next to another pattern. And the very darkest of palace secrets. I heard the German prisoner wailing, do kill me. Kensington Palace Gardens was a place where torture went on. The Royal Palaces. Now, they're the epitome of style and grace. But many hide dark history. Until recently, the ultimate celeb royal combo, Meghan and Harry, lived in Nottingham Cottage. The French ambassador, whose home backs on
During the Second World War, MI-19, a branch of military intelligence, commandeered three houses on Kensington Palace Gardens, a private road next door to the palace. They became known as the London Cage, a secret interrogation centre for Nazi prisoners of war. Kate Williams has come to the National Archives to find out what was going on there. What I have here is a letter of complaint written by a German prisoner of war who was in the London cage, and it's pretty shocking stuff. He lists a number of different methods here used to get the confession out of him, and they are forms of torture. And he says he's lifted up by his legs, head downwards, dropped on his head, and then 10 buckets of water are poured on his head. And then he's pushed down a flight of stairs with a cudgel, sort of big truncheon, knocking me in the back so he almost broke all his limbs. And what he makes clear in this letter is that it's not just him. And he says here... At the end of November 1946, I heard the excited voice of a German prisoner wailing all over the house, do kill me, I can't stand it any longer, kill me. At the time, the prisoner's complaints were dismissed. But diaries kept by the head of the London cage proved torture did go on there. He asked his soldier to kneel down and then I boxed his ears with my open hand and... Um, we had no further trouble with this man in the cage. The shocking secret of the London cage was kept hidden from the public for decades. These men were evil, these men were Nazis, but it was up to us on the other side to be civilized. Officers, soldiers, all kinds of men were tortured there. And this was only a stone's throw from Kensington Palace. The most famous current residents of Kensington Palace are the Cambridges. William and Kate live in the rather humble-sounding apartment 1A at Kensington Palace, but it is anything um, apart from humble. It's believed to have cost 4.5 million to renovate this 20-room apartment. There are several reception rooms, ensuite bedrooms, night nurseries, day nurseries, dining rooms. These are not apartments as you and I would think of them. William and Kate could have bought a street of 19 or almost 20 average houses for what they spent simply doing up 1A. So what did they spend it on? In 2014, we got a peep through the Cambridge's keyhole thanks to the visit of another famous couple, the Obamas. William and Kate released photos that gave us a tantalising glimpse of their home. It was pretty unusual and it was great fun looking at the pictures and looking at the, their cushions and their decor. It's not very Ikea, is it? Uh, Kate and Will's uh, decorating taste is a long way from most of us. It's tapestries, really expensive oriental rugs. There were very nice kind of personal touches, but also modern touches, like a clear glass acrylic side table. They had a Smirnoff vodka bottle, which is really not the most top drawer brand, uh, di clearly displayed on their cocktail carts. There was a rocking horse the Obamas had gifted to Prince George on his first birthday. 
What the children's rooms in 1A look like is a strictly guarded secret. But we do know one thing they contain. Isa Minkiewicz runs a baby shop in Kensington, down the road from the palace. Uh, this is Moses Basket. This is a very cozy little place. So it puts a baby at ease when the baby sleeps there. And it was one like this that Kate snapped up two months before the arrival of Prince George. So it was actually a rainy day when she came, um, accompanied by her mum. She was very relaxed, actually, so she took her time looking at uh, various products, uh, browsing through. I was very surprised, actually, how relaxed the visit was. Kate has not been the only royal decorating a nursery recently. Meghan and myself had a baby boy um, early this morning, a very healthy boy. Um, mother and baby are doing incredibly well. The Sussexes have been transforming Frogmore Cottage, a 10-bedroom pad on the Windsor Castle estate, into a home fit for little Archie. We're told that they've spent £150,000 on the nursery for the new baby. We know there's been a new staircase. We know there's a, a yoga studio. You have what is essentially five separate cottages being turned into one residence. We know that in one fiscal year, it was upwards of 2.4 million pounds, but the renovations are still ongoing, so the ultimate cost is going to be far higher. And that hasn't gone down well with everyone. I don't think one can do that kind of thing and not expect to be criticised over renovations that, let's remind everybody, is a completely private property. You can't, the public isn't allowed to go and see it like they are with Buckingham Palace. It's believed their interiors have been inspired by their favourite posh members club. The girl who's been responsible for helping with the renovations is Vicky Charles, and she was formerly of Soho House. So we know that they are very, very keen on that hotel and that style. That's also where Meghan had her hen nights. I think it'll be a little bolder than uh, the way Kate and William would have decorated their house. But what of the Queen's personal style? Every now and again, we catch a brief glimpse of Her Majesty's private apartments. The Queen style is just wonderful. It's housewife 50s. And the wonderful thing is that the Queen doesn't really like change, so she never bothers to change the decor. If it works, you just keep it. The Queen is big on chintz. She's big on patterns. She's never seen a pattern that she doesn't want to put next to another pattern. Lots of knickknacks, lots of private photographs, mismatched uh, cushions and rugs, and really um, not what one might have expected. They show to what extent she is basically very down to earth. There's nothing fantabulous about any of her private apartments. When you are, you don't need to remind yourself of how grand you are. When decorating, unlike us, the royals don't pop down to the local DIY store. They dip into the royal collection, one of the largest treasure troves of art in the world. How big is the royal collection? How much time have you got? It's a massive collection, over a million works of art. It includes 7,000 paintings, 450,000 photos, textiles, tapestries, armor, and weapons spread across the royal palaces. You can't put a value on it um, because nobody knows what the value is. It's none of it is insured because you can't insure it because you don't know what the value is. A large part of the royal collection is made up of antique furniture. Now we've got to lash the springs in side to side. For almost two decades, Kevin Andrews was summoned regularly to the Queen Mother's Royal Lodge at Windsor. Definitely worked that. The only way I could describe it, it was something like you'd see on the TV, like on Downton Abbey. There were just staff everywhere. I mean, it's, it's gardeners and maintenance men. And we're going to tease the fibre forward. Kevin re-upholstered the Queen Mum's furniture 
in the same way it had been done for centuries. We did all of her bedroom over the course of the summer, and we did um, a, a sofa and then the base of her bed, the divan part of it, put new springs in it, all the horse hair and stuffing that was in it was sent off to be washed and cleaned, and a lot of what came out actually went back in again. So that was quite a big project. Um, that took quite a few weeks to do. As a regular to the royal home, Kevin knew his way around, especially in break times. And I always used to make a point of visiting the kitchens because he'd never left there without something very well cooked, like a lovely nice sandwich or a pie or a pastry or a cake. But it was a friend of his who had the ultimate royal treatment when it was time for tools down. He was in one of the rooms in Buckingham Palace and um, dismantling a desk. And the door opened and a woman said, well, would you like a cup of tea? And he said, yes, I want a cup of tea in a mug, two sugars, builder's tea. I don't want any of that nonsense I had last time I was here with all that fine china and all that sauce of stuff. So she went off and she came back and she said, I'll put your tea on the table here. And he came out and you can guess who it was. It was the Queen. The best place to see the Queen's personal decorating style is Balmoral Castle, her summer getaway. Owned by the Queen herself, it's not an official palace, but with a seven-storey tower, servants' quarters, and set in 50,000 acres, it certainly looks the part. We know that the Queen and Prince Philip absolutely adore Balmoral. They've both said publicly that they feel their most relaxed, that they can really switch off there. They both love the outdoorsy lifestyle, all those pictures you see of the Queen with the headscarf on, driving her Land Rover around, full of dogs, riding her horses, walking in the glens. That is uh, the place I think that she loves the most. Despite it being her holiday home, the Queen often hosts prime ministers and dignitaries at Balmoral. Your Majesty, how wonderful to see you again. But it's also the place ordinary folk are most likely to bump into a royal. It's even happened to my father on one occasion. I was in the car with him and I remember the Queen coming down a lane and we suddenly veered off. Luckily, we survived. I thought we were going to let you go down an embankment or something. Uh, but my father was like, it's the Queen, you know? So it does, it does happen. Not only that, but once a year, staff get to mingle with royalty at the Gillies Ball, held in the castle's grand ballroom. I go into the, into the ballroom and it was like something out of a movie. You've, you've got every day in there looking absolutely amazing. You've got this orchestra playing up above you. The national anthem plays, the royal family walk in, and I remember the Duchess of Cornwall coming across the room to find me, and we did the first dance, and that was already terrifying, and we finished. And I remember kind of turning around as soon as the music stopped, and the Queen was behind me. And I remember thinking, help, <laughs> what, what do I do? And of course I nodded my head and said, good evening, your majesty. And the music started up and she'd write, and it went like this. And we, a, a dance started, went into a reel. Um, and in the reel was the Prince of Wales, the Duchess of Cornwall, myself, the Queen, the Duke of Edinburgh, and one other. When he's not dancing, Prince Charles likes to relax in his own pile at Balmoral, Burke Hall with some unusual guests. And I remember on this one occasion, seeing the squirrels coming into the house, and I went to kind of take them back in. I remember the prince suddenly appeared, and he was like, oh, you've met the squirrels, and he explained that, that he fed them, and I just thought, isn't that wonderful? Squirrels are not the only rodents to be found inside a royal residence. Anybody who has a palace, or a castle knows old buildings have certain things that go with the territory. Bathrooms are never, practically ever, beside bedrooms, including at Buckingham Palace. And you have problems occasionally with things like mice. When Obama stayed at the palace, uh, reportedly a 
butler burst in and said, I'm sorry, sir, there's a mouse in this room. And Obama told the servant not to mention it to the First Lady because she was scared of them. It's not very common, but when you've got an old building uh, that hasn't been really touched for a considerable number of years, you're invariably going to get some form of rodent running around. Have a pet mouse in your room? Why not? Coming up, what will happen to the royal palaces when Charles becomes king? Will he move into Buckingham Palace? I doubt it. And the scandalous history of the Queen's official Scottish residence. She had the worst husbands in royal history. Now, there's competition, but she definitely had the worst. The homes of the British monarchy may be some of the grandest in the world, but some are less lived in than others. While everyone's heard of Balmoral, the Queen's official Scottish residence is the Palace of Holyrood House in Edinburgh. When you are the monarch of a united kingdom with four different nations, it makes sense to have a palace in each place. Why not? Shame they don't have one in Wales. Largely built in the 17th century, it has 289 rooms, including the Great Gallery, featuring portraits of every Scottish monarch. Once a year, the Queen travels there for her Scottish appointments and stays for a week. It may not be the centre of events now, but of all the royal palaces, Holyrood has one of the most gory histories, including the murder of Rizzio. Mary, Queen of Scots, became Queen of Scotland when she was just six days old. She had an turbulent, incredible life, and she also had the worst husbands in royal history. Now, there's competition, but she definitely had the worst. Mary's second husband, Lord Darnley, thought if he could find an excuse to depose her, he could rule in her place. And in 1566, he accused her of an affair with someone in her close circle. So David Rizzio, he goes everywhere with her. She's very fond of him. One night, Saturday night, in Holyrood, Mary is in her closet with her friends, with Rizzio, and in breaks all these lords, loads of them. She knows them, they all come breaking in. They seize Rizzio, and she tries to get him back, tries to shield him with her skirts. They hold a gun to her pregnant stomach. They drag Rizzio off, and they stab him and throw him down the stairs. So then they take Mary prisoner, she escapes, gets back on the throne. But this is a terrible, bloody night in Scottish history. There was blood all over Mary, blood all over her supper chamber, all over her bedroom and all over Holyrood. Holyrood is not the only ancient royal palace that's a little less high profile these days. Just round the corner from Buckingham Palace lies the much older St. James's Palace. Built by Henry VIII, it was home to kings and queens for three centuries. But now, it's mainly an admin centre. It comes really into its own, I suppose, at the time of the accession of the new sovereign, when the Garter King of Arms proclaims the new sovereign from the walkway overlooking Friary Court. And now, the Palace of St. James, the centre of the Commonwealth, London. The crown is solely and rightfully come to the high and mighty Princess Elizabeth Alexandra Mary. St. James's Chapel Royal has been home to royal christenings, including Prince Louis, and was where Meghan was baptised weeks before her wedding. Attached to St. James's is Clarence House. Built by the future William IV, it was here Princess Elizabeth lived with her family before her accession, and where she would have liked to have remained. We are told that it was the Prime Minister of the day, Winston Churchill, who persuaded her that it really was her constitutional duty as head of state to move into Buckingham Palace. For the next 50 years, the Queen Mother would live there. And now, it's the official residence of Prince Charles. Just like his mother, it's believed he would prefer to stay there 
rather than move around the corner to Royal HQ. Prince Charles has long been rumoured uh, to be rather resistant to the inevitable pressure on him to move into Buckingham Palace when the time comes. It's possible that he would remain in Clarence House and just do all his formal business from Buckingham Palace. Will he move into Buckingham Palace? I doubt it. He'll, he'll work out of uh, St James's Palace and just use Buckingham Palace as headquarters of monarchy, PLC. Whoever's on the throne, the royal palaces are central to the work and spectacle of monarchy. Magnificent buildings that reflect the history, grandeur and enduring appeal of our royal family. Our royal palaces are a part of our history and as such, they are invaluable. All you've got to do is walk around Buckingham Palace at any time of the day and see thousands of, of, of tourists milling around. They're very much part of the country, part of Britain. They're aspirational, aren't they? Most of us are never going to live in anywhere as grand as that, and we like to have a peek inside. <laughs>